Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. Um, we are thrilled to be coming to you uh, virtually. We wish that we were gathered together physically in the space of Keras Books. We are gathered with old friends tonight, um, both of whom have presented books in the physical space of Keras before. Um, so it feels a little like old home week, but um, it's really nice to have y'all um, here with us virtually. So I'm gonna introduce um, Tristan Cotton first. Tristan is the editor and founder of Transgress Press. Um, his current positions are Associate Professor of Gender and African American Studies at California State University. Stan Stanislaus. Uh, Stanislaus. Actually, I'm a full you. professor. Okay, awesome. Yeah, you didn't know, yeah, Stanislaus, yeah. Yes, uh, and Managing Editor of Transgress Press. He travels extensively around the world speaking on trans identities and issues his current research deals with gender, race, and migration in the African diaspora. He's edited, is it still five books or has that changed? It's about seven now. Seven, okay, good. Uh, and written numerous articles on these issues. Um, one of his more recent books um, that you can buy from Karis is Hung Jury, Testimonies of Genital Surgery by Transsexual Men and Transgender Migrations, The Bodies, Borders, and Politics of Transition. Um, and he, He's here tonight to talk to Kim Green, whose book we are celebrating. Kim Green is a writing coach, editor, copywriter, and the author of the novels Hallucination and Vicissitudes. You can learn more about her work at, via a link that I'm going to drop in the chat. Um, but it's really lovely to have you both here. Thank you so much for celebrating your book with us tonight. Well, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Like you yes. said, it is like old home week. <laughs> so I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, ER. You're welcome. So we wanted yeah. to start it out by just playing um, your book trailer because that's such a fun thing to do. Um, and it'll give folks a sense of um, how the book kind of works. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. This is definitely like coming home. Uh, it's nice. Technology is incredible. It allows I'm actually in Berkeley at the moment, um, um, but I lived in Atlanta for decades and um, love Karis Bookstore. So glad we're still kicking and thriving. And um, thank you so much for, for, for coming tonight. And we hope to have a good night. We're going to have some readings and have a little discussion with Kim about the book and, and have some Q&A so that everybody gets to learn a little bit more about vicissitudes. And I'll tell you what, for me, uh, what I love about the book, I think it, that it is incredibly exquisitely written. Um, <clears throat> I am a literary critic, and so I know good literature when I see it. And Kim is an eloquent writer. What, but what in particularly I liked about the book is that she captures the hearts and minds of many trans people who um, are just trying to be ourselves every day, trying to live our truths. And of course, we want to be loved and we want to, to love someone. And so this book is very much about that, but it's also about love in other kinds of relationships and um, what happens to people when we don't see each other or allow ourselves to live the tr truth 
upset that we are. Um, when the, Kim first gave me the book, I'll tell you how, how, how thrilled I was about the book. When Kim first sent me the manuscript, I told her, I'm, I was in Europe at the time and I was filming and I had to go to Berlin for a couple of weeks to do some filming. And so I said to her, I will get back to your manuscript when I get back because I have an overloaded schedule right now and I know that I will not be able to give it the full attention that I need to. So, of course, you know, my curiosity got the better of me and I'm going to peek it a little bit, right? You just read a couple of pages <laughs> just to see if she can write, right? Just to see uh, how, how she, cause you, you know, I get manuscripts in all kinds of shape. Well, let me tell you what. I started reading the first few pages and I couldn't stop. It's literally a page turner. The, 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 the story compels you to, to, to move forward in it. And I finished the book in three days <laughs> and I had a mound of other work to do, a very busy schedule, but it was, I was just so enthralled with it. And particularly with the, the depth of characters and the exploration, uh, the way Kim explores the depths of people's hearts and minds and the things that we're struggling with. And I also thought it was truly amazing because I am uh, a trans man and um, Kim is a cisgender woman. And I was really in awe that someone had, a cisgender woman had captured uh, so so accurately and, and so uh, incredibly well uh, the, the, some of the things that trans men deal with in the world. Um, so, uh, I, of course, I immediately sent her an email, email back and I said, we've got to sign you to a contract. We've got to get this out. This is a beautiful book. And here we are. Right. So um, what we're going to do tonight is talk some uh, a little bit about we've got a few passages that we want to read and kind of highlight to you some things in the book that we find really interesting. And we think that you, uh, the readership of Karis, would find interesting as well. So we're going to kind of start with a few little icebreakers and we're going to let Kim talk a little bit about some of the characters um, and, and the basic plot of the Sisitude. Because um, in, in the book, everyone is, every character is on a journey of self-discovery and development of their own. And so, but there are also relationships in the book as well that are also on a journey or an arc of development of discovery and growth. And so we're going to just let Kim talk a little bit about some of these characters and what she was trying to do with certain um, uh, setups, okay? Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, when I talk about vicissitudes, I get very excited because it was such a journey for me to write this book and to delve into the unknown and learning about trans men and but also what I love about the experience is that I started to lean in to my own life, my own emotions, my, my own personal vicissitudes. And I realized they were all very similar. We all are working to change ourselves and be something else, um, to be the person that we really believe that we are. So I think that that made it easy. Um, and in my own personal life, in my own journey, I've had those same experiences. So I, it was a really great, it was an easy journey in um, and so I have lots of characters that are all different. They're all different races and there are some biracial and all of these things. Because to me, that's the world I want to see. Um, that's the world that I live in. And I want to encourage people to start seeing the world that way. Um, and so um, I don't know. John is the star of the show. He's the, the, the uh, bane of everybody's existence as well as their, the center of their affections. And um, he's a trans man who's just trying to find love in the complicated situation he is physically. Um, and I wanted him to meet a woman that turns him around. And Morgan, who's the main character, she also was, has been div divorced and hurt and emotionally um, stifled. And she decides to open up to John and both of them are very surprised about what they find when they open up. And I think, I think that's all I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> but we'll, we'll hear more when we read a little and hear a little bit about the characters and the situations. Okay, good. Thank you, Kim. Um, just a little curious, you could tell, tell us what, how you came up with the word vicissitudes for the title. Uh, a very long word, 
not, not and not everyone knows what you know what it means off the bat. So uh, I think it's the first novel I've seen with that title. So how how did you come up with that title? Well, it's funny. I came up with the the first title that I came up with was I'm embarrassed to share it, but I'm going to share it. Was here and now H E A R period and now. And so the point that I was trying to make is like the world is changing and we have to listen to the things that are happening and be aware of the changes. So that's kind of what I was thinking. And I also workshopped my book in um, a thing called Fiction Intensives, which is an awesome group of writers in Atlanta. And um, I had used the word vicissitude somewhere in the book and my writing coach turned to me one day and said, why don't you call the book vicissitudes. And I almost fainted because I was like, oh, that's exactly what I should be calling the book. Like what, what was here and now? Um, so I love it. But to talk about the real meaning of it is obviously the word means change. And I think that as a culture, we are experiencing change that we never imagined. And we're, we're experiencing change in the fact that we no longer trust our government. We have people who we don't even understand how they are in government. Uh, we have all of these, we, we went through so far with our black president and then we had a man come and take it all away from us. Um, we had, you know, gay marriage and then we were taking it back. So we are up and down, like we all are emotionally on the edge of our seats because we don't know what's gonna happen. But I think what this book tries to do is talk about the fact that we all survive we get there, whatever happens, we still survive, we're still here. And um, so the characters go through a lot emotionally. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of things going on. And at the end of the book, I think they all kind of come to peace with who they are and what they've learned from their journey. And I hope that that's what vicissitudes means, that it's change, but we must learn to work with it and grow into it and lean into it. And we, we survive. So that's kind of what the vicissitudes title meant to me and my teacher who was like, you know, vicissitudes is ex exactly what the book is because there are so many ups and downs with all the characters. Great, thank you. Yes, every all, all of the characters and the relationships uh, undergo significant change. And I think the book does very much speak to what we're dealing with cognitively and emotionally, socially and politically. Um, and I certainly found it inspiring in the sense of that the, there's this the idea, the book gives you the idea that um, change is not something to be afraid of or right. difference yeah. is not yeah. necessarily to be right. afraid of. And that um, <clears throat> actually, if we could just flip that narrative and embrace change, embrace up and down, uh, I think it was an old sort of Buddhist um, um concept that you know the only th thing that's that's constant is change um right. yeah. and if we embrace that then we can find identity in, in that process identity and belonging which is what so many people are looking for uh, a sense of themselves uh and 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 love and support and connection w with other people so mm -hmm. you know, uh, i found that to be um, one of the deeper philosophical underpinnings of of this institutes yeah Good. <laughs> so with that, um, talking about that a little bit, let's, let's actually get into some of the characters and relationships a little, because uh, this actually gives us an opportunity when we're talking about change to, to I'm curious, Kim, why, <clears throat> so Kim falls in, uh, I mean, Morgan falls in love with John. John is a trans man mm -hmm. and Morgan is um, heterosexual cisgender woman. Mm -hmm. um, and um, she falls in love with John initially without knowing. And so I'm, I'm curious about why you set it up like that and what you, what you might've been doing with. Um, That's a good that. question. The reason why I, the, well, not the reason, but I know that when I was writing it and thinking about creating this whole story, I really wrote from the place of what if, what if you meet someone that is not what you were supposed to meet? What if you meet a person who's black and you're white? What if you meet a person who's Hispanic and you're white? You know, whatever it is. Um, and what if you are a straight cisgender woman and you meet a trans man? What if? Um, and what if your heart leads you and society 
doesn't lead you. What, what about that? So that's kind of where I went with this book. I just wanted <clears throat> John to be in the setting of all kinds of people. I wanted him to not necessarily be among other trans people. I wanted him to be out in the world, meeting, greeting, being himself. And the thing that I loved was, was so fun writing about him is he's very charismatic, he's sexy, he's attractive. He's all of these things that would make any woman be excited about him. And um, the fact that he's in transition is not so visible. Um, and so this is why it got so far until it had to be uh, disclosed. But um, I really wanted to write about what if. What if we have to change the way we think what if we fall in love with somebody who we're not supposed to? And that's sort of where the book sort of takes off from that idea. Good. And you know, the thing about dating for, for folks who are trans and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all people who are queer, but I'm gonna speak as a trans man um, and not for all trans men, but there is a general sense among trans people that, you know, issues, things come up for us. When it, when, when it comes to love and dating and romance. And um, there's a really beautiful passage uh, in, in Vicissitudes where John is, is, is he's likes Morgan a lot. And um, I'm wondering if you could just, just bring that out for us a little bit, just that, 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 that page. Is this the disclosure? Sort of give us a little bit of a, this is okay, right. That. So, cause I think it gives us an opportunity to, to see, A, we wanted to see how beautiful the writing is. So that was another aspect of it too for, for why we, we published this book is the writing is just, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it, the, we, the book needed no revision. Um, <laughs> it came to us pretty much complete. So we want people to get a sense of the, the, the way that you work with words. And, and also uh, I think that that passage gives us a chance to sort of talk about some of those things that comes up when people are reaching or, or falling in love across lines of difference. Uh, and 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 confronting something or someone they don't quite understand. Okay, good. Well, we I call we call this passage the disclosure passage, and um, okay. this is when uh, they've been on a couple of moments of seeing each other, and this is when John realizes that he needs to tell her, like he's been sort of faking it a little bit, not talking about it. And then he, it comes to his mind, I have to tell her right now. So he calls her and he says, I'm going to pick you up in a few minutes. It's going to be, just get ready. I'll be there in a few minutes. So uh, he takes her to a park at nighttime. And this is sort of what happens. We sit side by side. Our gazes are set, looking out over the lake that is only a black hole at night. Both of his hands are knotted into fists that rest on his jumpy knees. For this first time, John struggles with his words. It's really not a big deal, but his twitching body says it is. I'm listening, I say, nervously retwisting a lock of my hair. Without turning to face me, he says, Morgan, I was born female. I've been undergoing transition for eight years, which requires therapy to confirm that transition is what I really want. And it's to make sure that I'm ready for all that being a man entails. I had top surgery four years ago and I've been taking male hormones for almost three. I will eventually have bottom surgery, which is what I've been saving for. My face is blank. I do not hate him for this news, although this unveiling confounds me, forcing me to question my own desires. He turns to face me and my eyes meet his startled gaze. Still, his liquid eyes take me to a place of no return. Grappling with what to say or not to say, I can only blurt out a regrettable question. What was your name? Morgan, what I've just disclosed is not an invitation to dig up a forgotten past. You deserve to hear this from me, so I told you. My life story is not gossip. I told you out of respect. If you want to know me, you must know where I come from. But my past is no longer relevant, and neither is my dead name. My head aches, <clears throat> trying to grasp these new words and ideas. His eyes are wide open, hungry for my acceptance. Mine are closed, searching for words that won't further offend. Why won't you tell me your old name? Because it no longer belongs to me. It's not who I am anymore. Consider her dead. If it will make you feel better, choose any name that you like and fill in the blank. Amy, Martha, Sally, 
Mary, for Christ's sake, I am not any of those names. The only name that I answer to is John. But if it makes you feel better, I feel slightly dizzy, confused by his impatience and sudden anger. So how do you want me to feel? The way that I still feel about you? I don't answer, not being completely sure what any of it means. One more question, I say, despite the countless questions that are populating in my brain. He waits. Why didn't you tell me this? Why didn't you trust me enough to say something before we kissed? I didn't tell you because I care about you. I wanted us to get to know you without the taint of my complications. If I disclosed this last night or when I picked you up at the airport or even at the wedding, I guarantee we wouldn't be here today. Revealing this simple truth often makes people smile politely, listen intently, and then create an excuse for why I'll never see them again. Suddenly I'm mad. John, I'm not some people. I'm a woman that you know and you say that you care about. I'm a woman like Renee who carries around a chronic disease that is invisible to others, but each day our minds and bodies are forced to bear the painful, uncomfortable, unrelenting truth of it all. You think I'm going to run away from you? Where could I run? You've already brought me here. Beautiful. I love the way you read. I love the, the, the it, you have a way of, the words are soft and they just sort of swirl around you when you, when, when you paint a scene. And then there are times when you interject this humor. Like I almost cracked up when fill in the blank, Amy, Alice, you know, whatever <laughs> you like. Uh, because I, you know, uh, I could relate to uh, those aspects of John that, and I think some some trans people can do. They don't necessarily want to dig up the past, mm -hmm. but uh, some of us also live with that past inside of us. Um, and so, just wondered, um, can you talk a little bit about sort of this, the disclosure or, or and what you're trying to do with that character in that scene? Well, well I'm trying to do a couple things in that scene. I obviously want to. I, this book is completely fiction. It's a you know some a story that I love and that I created. But I also want to be educational. I want the mainstream world to understand this thing because it's breaking my heart how much trouble it's causing. <laughs> like, I just, I, I just don't understand it. Um, and I just want people to understand how serious it is, how painful it is, how important it is for one to become who they are. Um, and so in this scene, I wanted... Morgan to do what cis heterosexual people do. They ask a lot of questions that are not preferred, <laughs> never something that people like, but it's also the truth of how we live among each other, amongst each other. So I wanted her to be naive and ask the questions. And even though he said, you know, don't ask anything, and she asked yet another question. So I wanted for her to see herself. I want that heterosexual cis way of not understanding things and keep pushing. Um, I think that's a real way that people behave. Um, but I also wanted John to kind of fight for the truth of not wanting to go backwards. And I think that that is very important um, for all of us. You know, we want to go forward. And especially for trans people, it's very important to go in their new skin, be the person that they know they are. So I wanted that conversation to come up and I wanted her also to realize at that choice point that she's not going anywhere. Like I, my favorite line of the whole book is, uh, I do not hate him for this news. It just causes me confusion about what I want and my own desires. So I, I think that those are the complications, these are the vicissitudes that we all deal with when we love someone and then there's things about them that are unexpected. So that's kind of what I was doing with, in that scene, just trying to have her be herself and have him give us the truth of how it should go. <laughs> and what it, it, he, you can't be asking all these questions. And I think that's important that people understand that. You did a great job of that. And and I'm going to dive in a little a little further with that about um, some of the issues that, that they both come up with. But I just want to say for a moment, just for the audience, um, 
when Kim talks about, if you heard how she described uh, straight people, cisgender people tend to ask a lot of questions because they're naive. Um, and she very <laughs> painted, you know, or, or drew that, that moment of Morgan's character um, so accurately. And the same thing sort of with John uh, and, and the response sometimes of trans people. And sometimes we're, we're, you know, we don't always understand each other where we're coming from. Sometimes people talk past each other or we make presumptions about, um, you know, wh why is she digging into my past? Doesn't she understand that, like, I wouldn't have transitioned if I didn't, if I still wanted to let her talk about mm -hmm. that path or live that past out. Um, and so I just want to say for the audience, when I was talking at the beginning about what I found so compelling about the way the book is written and, and the skill, the, 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 the writing skill is that it is the, um, and this is the professor in me. So just, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm speaking, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it understand that it is the mark of a good writer who can get out of their own skin, which most of us can't do, don't do, we don't exercise it in our, we, maybe we could if we did the sort of creative work that writers do, but there is a certain skill and a talent to being able to come out of your own skin and to situate yourself in another person's skin, their perspective, mm -hmm. and see it from that and then to describe that. Because most of the time we, we carry the baggage with us uh, and that's what prevents us sometimes uh, from, from being able to see things from another perspective. And so that's one of the things I really enjoy about your book, Kim, is that uh, you don't sacrifice your characters to your own ego. You you literally move out of your own, when I mean ego, I just mean identity, not mm -hmm, ego. Sure. You uh, have this ability to just let go of who you are and your own embodiment and, and existence. And and really, this is why I, 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 I find it so compelling that I think I said this to you when we talked, when we zoomed in, when I was in Europe, <clears throat> I said, I, I, I can't believe a cisgender woman wrote, or it's just, it's, I'm still trying to get my head around you know, through this character so accurately, you know, because we tend to think that, you know, black women can only write about black women. They can only, you know, or, or talk about black issues um, or same thing about queers that people can only sort of talk about or situate themselves within a certain context that can't stretch any farther than, 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 than the limits of our embodied social existence. And so um, I just, you know, hats off to you, Kim, for, for having that talent and that skill and being able to, to, to thread that through vicissitudes. I am very grateful for that. Well, I'm, and I'm hoping that it's helpful to people. I mean, I'm hoping, I've had a lot of people say to me, this is going to help people with trans children. It's going to, you know, it's just, and the most and other important thing about the book for me is that it was so important that John prevails that it wasn't going to be a tragic trans story because there are there is tragic elements obviously of the experience and I'm very aware of that and it's in the book as well but I wanted John to be this the star of the show that he is he's a really charismatic person he's got a great personality he's been through a lot um and I wanted him to be the attractive desirable person that he is and that that would not be unusual in the world that I see, that we can love people um, because of who they are and their personalities and the things that they, how they make us feel, you know? And I think that is what John does for Morgan. And I think that that is, makes me happy. <laughs> well, it makes me happy. And I think it makes a lot of our readers happy too, that we can have a, a positive, you know, we have a positive image of masculinity and manhood in John. And that, you, you know, they're, they're, he doesn't die at the end. Or he yeah. doesn't, you know, there's no tragedy, right? Or he's not, you know, it's so, I, and I think trans folks, we definitely need to have more of that, those images um, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and in the public sphere and the kinds of images that aren't driven by market and market yes. capitalism, which tends to co-opt, uh, it's been co-opting gay identity, uh, and queer identity for decades, um, sort of profiteering off of that. And so it's nice that that you, a writer, um, can can give us those images and that it's not about profit, you know, motive. It's not driven by a profit motive. And so mm -hmm. I thank you as mm -hmm. a trans man for a man <laughs> complex and whole and also very much dealing with issues that a lot of us trans guys are dealing with in the world. You know? yeah. And, 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 and not, and, you know, you explore a lot of things in there, not just the issues he deals with love and romance, but 
some of the other issues around dealing with other men, cisgender men and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we really may get to, but you know, I just want to thank you for that positive image. And I think also black people, black folks need to have those kinds of images as well, um, yeah. a, a lot more. Uh, and I think it helps us in the black community to see images of uh, positive images of queer and trans people. <clears throat> so, mm-hmm. you know, to uh, maybe interrupt this way, we tend to write people off in black communities for being queer or, uh, or, or, or trans. So, mm-hmm. uh, um, <clears throat> so that was a little bit of a side. And, and what I want to do is a little bit dive a little bit more into this issue of the relationship, because in this passage, you talk about, um, you know, there's obviously there's things of disclosure that comes mm-hmm. up for him fear of rejection, uh, ridicule, possibly. Uh, I think for many trans women, sometimes too, there's a fear of violence. Um, if it's mm-hmm. a man who who they're disclosing to, um, the fear of violence that you are, or, or even murder for that matter. And so um, uh, what, I want to get a little bit into, he has, he has this past and he has these images or, or certain idea about his body and whether or not mm-hmm. it will be you know, good enough for her, or if, it, it, mm-hmm. you know, after all, let's be real, she's a heterosexual cisgender woman, so that means that she was raised with a certain social script for how mm-hmm. to be with men, and mm-hmm. uh, and what to think and assume about men, and so um, I'm, I'm wondering, though, because also, it turns out, Morgan has her mm-hmm. own issue as well, and so as we move along in the narrative, we start to see they're they're dealing with different issues about bodies, their bodies, mm-hmm. and what they feel about them. But they're they're different, and so mm-hmm. um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about Morgan's stuff uh, around the body, and I'll just leave it. Okay. Take. Well, uh, and as uh, in the scene, he she says, you know, I'm having a, a chronic illness, so she's talking about the fact that she has lupus, and Ren- Renee is a, the other character who also has lupus. So black women tend to have have, have a lot of lupus, actually. So um, that is just a real thing. And for me, as a person who has lupus, it was important to me that there is a character who's, quote unquote, imperfect um, and also desirable and in love and having sex and all of the good stuff that everybody doesn't have to be, you know, tall and thin and skinny and perfect with perfect skin and all of this. I mean, th- this is not reality. So it was important to me for all characters in this book, as um, I, there's another reading that I'm going to do that talks a little bit about Renee, who also has lupus. Um, so I wanted, I really wanted to talk, explore people being imperfect and having um, having relationships still, despite imperfection. And I think that he, she is, with her lupus, there's a lot of, you know, skin things and all these, you know, unfortunate things that happen with people with lupus and all kinds of chronic illnesses create these things, you know, bad skin and all this. And we really wanted, I really wanted her to still find love and still be sexual and desirable. And um, it, it was important to me that that she uh, it is not perfect. And, you know, she, you know, in the book, she's, you know, has trouble with her shoes and she's wearing high heels and her feet hurt and these are all things that are not glamorous this is not what you read you know it should be this dope beautiful woman perfect in stilettos but that's not realistic and even the people who are like that i have a very good friend who's a stiletto girl and you know at the back room is that she's got feet problems and has to go have surgery you know what i mean that's the truth but she's always clicking around in the heels so I think that is kind of what I wanted to do, just like break through these ideas of what are desirable. And that is kind of what John and Morgan, to me, they both represent that we are enough. That, uh, and I, I really appreciate it that you uh, have characters in the book who, with disabilities mm-hmm. and the way you sort of talk about their disabilities as, um, there are things that are part of who they are, so we're going to acknowledge them. And and there's a way in which you sort of talk about, um, at least from the perspective of the world and how they see them, uh, dis- bodies, uh, disabled bodies, uh, trans bodies, bodies that are I'll, I'll just say non-normative bodies right. in the yeah. general category. But, 
um, there's a, what I really appreciate the way that you talk about them is exactly what you just said. You there's a, you can describe um, some of the particulars of from the subjective perspective, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So what is it like? Well, you know, or um, if, if if you know, on, with, with the shoes, Morgan speaks <laughs> well with the strap. Um, and, and she's got some, some scars on her legs and, and on her back. But what's interesting is that you're able to talk about that in an unremarkable way. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is it's almost a way of normalizing mm -hmm. non normal bodies so yeah. that these that we call, quote, disabilities or the non normative aspects of our, our embodiment um, in, in, the, in the book, they're just a part of life. That's right. just, yeah. you know, it's just, this is how it is. Um, and uh, it, rather than to see it as a, to, to sort of turn it into a tragedy or uh, to to focus on it as something that's a pet, in, uh, um, um, what, impediment, is that the word? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, an obstacle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's that beautiful scene where uh, I think it's Renee and Morgan, they go to the mm -hmm. beach. And they yes. Mm -hmm. the, the, right. Yeah, can you say a little bit about that? That's another sort of ancillary um, character. Well, it, it's sort of a funny st story, actually, and 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 Tristan seems to find all these humorous things. But what happened is that Renee and Morgan have to take their uh, Morgan's nine-year-old daughter to the beach because she's they're in California. They live in Atlanta, but they're in California, and uh, so the little girl wants to go to the beach. And so Renee says, because she's sort of the godmother of of the little girl, and she says, "Oh, I'm going to take you to the beach tomorrow." So when they're going to the beach, they both crack up laughing because people with lupus are not supposed to be in the sun, and so she's like, "How ridiculous! We both are going to go to the beach." And we're not really allowed to be there and we'll be, you know, sick and swollen up if we do it. So they, you know, all of these things are the reality of people. So many people have these things. So many people, um, as, as Robin Roberts once said, uh, everybody has something, you know, so that is true. And that is something that I actually teach my son all the time. Like whatever is going on with your body, it's everybody has something. Um, and so anyway, in that scene, uh, Morgan and Renee are just kind of laughing about the fact that they're at the beach and they shouldn't be. And Renee is a little bit more rebellious. So she's like, I'm going out there in the sun, like I'm going in the beach, I'm going to the water. But Morgan is like, I'm staying in the car um, because I don't want to get sick. But what's interesting, the reason why she stays in the car is because she wants to call John. <laughs> so she's a little tricky around that. But she, you know, she's trying and it, I, they talk a little bit i talk a little bit about what they wear to the beach and that they're you know sort of covered in black clothes because that's to keep the sun away um so it's all of these little little things these little nuances that are very much a part of people's lives and so even with john um you know just one little thing that i'll share is that he obviously he work he's a um a gym teacher in a high school and he uh, makes it a point to live right near the high school so he can go to the bathroom at home so he doesn't have to use the public bathrooms. So these are the things, these are the little pieces that make us who we are. These are the things that create the, char the, the characteristics that make us who we are. Um, and I just really love exploring that stuff and not just these beautiful, great looking people. And of course I have a couple great looking people in the book. Of course, you gotta have that. But I also, they all have a little imperfections and that is what is the truth. So I, I really worked hard to create uh, the truth. And, and I'm really, I'm thankful for to, that you include uh, characters with disabilities in, mm -hmm. in your book, and not in a way that's sensational or to, mm -hmm. to sort of you know, make a plot move forward in some way. Um, so I'm, 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 I thank you very much for that because I feel like we don't see enough uh, uh, disabled characters, um, in, 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 particularly in, in black fiction. Um, <clears throat> um, and so I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I, I'm well, sure in fact, I, I want to, I want to say, I want to say one thing about that. Many, many years ago when I was writing hallucination, which is sort of the, the preface for vicissitudes, um, it was all about, you know, the character Morgan having lupus and first being diagnosed with it. And I remember I had a, a, an editor and she called me and she said, you know, it's good, but I think we should take all that sick stuff out. 
And to me, that is was so powerful because it's like, that's a reality of this character. Like how, why can't she exist with her disability, with her illness, with her chronic condition? Why can't she exist? And so, you know, after she said that, of course, I was like, Full, full steam ahead on the sick stuff because I think <laughs> that's the reality of things and I I want us all to be visible, you know, and, and whether it's a trans story or a lupus story or a woman's story or whatever it is, we all deserve to be visible and, and who we are without any, um, you know, whitewashing as it were. So that, that is a big mission of mine in my writing. Well, you do it really well. And and I, I want to just say something to the audience about something Kim said a little earlier about um, John. He lives close to the high school because he has, you know, he, once he didn't um, have to hold it all day long, which which many of us do, depends on the circumstances. Um, and so it's those just little things. When I was saying earlier about the way that um, it's extraordinary that you are able to capture so accurately and and um just so well you know trans existence in in just those those little things that just add up over the course of the book that that it's just it's, it's nice to see it's really <laughs> thrilling and, and it, it's actually a good it's inspiring to maybe some of the rest of us when they, maybe one day i'll write a novel who knows uh and get outside of my skin uh <laughs> Um, so it, it, now I want to um, come back to where we sort of started out talking about relationships mm -hmm. in the novel and um, and some of the challenges that trans people have in in relationships. And so we've talked a little bit about Morgan and sort of doing mm -hmm. in that character. And um, I'm, I'm wondering though if you could talk about um, there's another character in the book, Bethany, mm -hmm. and um, because Bethany allows us to kind of get into issues that come up for partners of trans people, uh -huh. people who, are, who are with us while we're transitioning and uh -huh. Lord, we could, you know, riff for days on that. That is a very important topic. It's, I feel like it does not get enough, uh, it's not addressed enough in, in, in trans and queer communities and spaces. And so I wonder if we could, we could talk a little bit about um, Bethany's character and, um, and, and a little bit about her and uh, maybe that there's a passage that we talked about. We could, we could explore her a little bit. Um, sure. I can read the passage maybe, and then we can talk about it after that. Okay. Um, okay. This, this is a scene where um, <clears throat> Morgan and John had their first intimate night. So they're really enthralled with each other and just can't keep their hands off of each other and just so in love and all of this. And so Bethany is one of John's best friends from his past. They grew up together. So Bethany knows both sides of John, knows everything. Um, but she's very um, emotional about John. And so uh, this is a scene where they all go back to Bethany's house to have brunch. So this is at the brunch table and uh, Bethany leaves the table because she can't stand what she's seeing. So here we go. She gets, off, gets up from the table. Standing in my garden, I gasp for air. Am I the only one sitting around this table who can see it? Is it just me who is pinched and pricked by the lies? I already know that he'll come looking for resuscitation after Morgan has crushed him but he will soon discover that he is not the only one who's changed. I belong to someone now too. When I injected that first shaky shot of manhood into her thigh, I never realized that I would be sending her off to a manly planet where I would no longer be needed. Does anyone care that it was my bare hands covered in blood caring for her when no one else would? How easily everyone forgot when I turned nurse changing pus-filled drains, removing post-surgical binders, and administering endless sponge baths. I doled out pain pills and spoke saccharine words of encouragement so that she could sleep through the night. I wiped away every drop of the salty sweat brought on by the hormonal gymnastics of transition. Does anyone care about that? Clearly, I've not been successful masking my resentment of John's new incarnation but I'm the one who helped her morph into this stranger named John. The minute she donned his new male skin, she discarded both of us. 
the stiff, awkward, short-haired girl that she was, and me, the girl that saved him from the death with unconditional love. I'd feared that she would desert me one day, even though I was the one who watched her learn to strut like a man, patiently waiting for her to get it right. How dare Morgan barge into our lives, playing sister to Renee and toying with John's unformed manhood. How silly she is, making him feel like he could ever be accepted into her monotonous suburban world. He's a transsexual for God's sake and she's not even queer. How dare she step into my home glowing from John's misplaced affections. How dare he look at her with eyes that once looked at me. That's a lot going on there with Bethany. <laughs> A lot going on and very much accurately described. And, and that's just one passage, folks. Uh, Bethany's character, there's a lot. Kim writes a lot about the interior. You, you get a lot to about what's going on inside of Bethany's head in this process. Um, <clears throat> and so tell us a little bit, Kim, what you were what you were doing with, with, with Bethany's character. Well, I think the most important, so vicissitudes really, you know, I talk a lot about it and it's all in the materials, is that this book is about the transformative power of love. And so, you know, John gets transformed, Morgan gets transformed, but then Bethany is going through her transformation of her own love for John and all of also her loss. She's lost John. He's not who he was before. Um, even though she had a lot to do with helping him transition to make that move, she's left out now. And um, it's interesting because when, when I was writing it, what I realized as the writer, and I did not intend this, but she was sort of getting jealous of him. She really kind of liked him in his new incarnation as a man. She liked him. She was attracted to him. And um, that's complicated. And I know that this trans um, experience is complicated for everyone, not just the trans person, not just the person who's transitioning, but for the people who loved before and want to love going forward, but don't really know how to do that without having the memories of the past. So I think it's a, a whole conversation about, you know, the trans experience is about letting go of the past. But all the people around you or the trans person also doesn't want to let go of the past. Some of that past was good. Some of that past was powerful. Um, and I remember one of my, during my research period, I got to interview a, a woman who had a trans child and she mentioned how it was a death. Um, she mm -hmm. had to realize that that was the death of her daughter and a, you know, a new experience with her son. Um, and she talked about um, hearing his voice on the voicemail um, the first time after the surgery and all of the uh, hormones had really taken effect and his voice had changed. Um, and she told me the story about, this was years ago, by the way, and she told me about the story and she cried at that when she heard the voice and hung up and cried. But when she was telling me this story 10 years later, she cried again. She's still, crying. it's still so raw and it's such a huge thing for people who are not trans, um, the people who are around and love the trans person. It is raw. It is something very painful. Um, and it's something that's beautiful. It's beautiful too, because they want to see the person they love happy, happier than they've ever been. But they, it's also just a very complicated thing. And it is a, a huge vicissitude that the world is dealing with, with this, this, the issues of the trans experience. Um, so I was just really exploring how one character was deeply involved in it, had a lot of love, and then it turned because of her own places that she was missing, you know, her own ability to be who she is, uh, perhaps. So I just, that was kind of what I was working on in that scene. <laughs> And it comes up again. She has another uh, blowout, by the way. So Bethany is consistently keeping it real with us and keeping us understanding the pain. She's my favorite character. Yeah, I mean, I love, I love Bethany. Yeah, that's my, that's the, the character I really love the most uh, because she's the most emotional and the most authentic. Right. In her emotional expression, right? So she's in her head and dealing with these things. She's not pushing them down in her unconscious. Right. Uh, and she has, you know, 
Bethany has other tragedies that 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 go along with, or, or other uh, losses that are that are from that past that that kind of burden her emotion or make the present you know emotional situation with John burdensome. And and we sort of learn about that later as we get further down in, in the books, like what what's sort of uh, compounding her pain, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think what I again sort of stepping aside as a as a, a literary critic um, as uh, I, I what what I love about the way you 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 I guess paint her character or, or or write her character is that you capture the emotional um, depth the emotional depth that seems to uh, sit situate seems to be situated and planted within people um, that make it difficult for or makes it a challenge so for them to just sort of move on and get mm -hmm. on board with the person. So it's a really good description of the, the, the woman and her child, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there there are, uh, and so I think there are ways that we don't sort of think about the ways in which relationships are charged with emotions. Mm -hmm. um, that, that And those emotions, they, they, they're buried in those emotions. And so you can cognitively get your head around a pronoun mm -hmm. uh, or physical change, but you still have the memory of, yeah. let's just take the parent child. Um, mm -hmm. You still have the memory when your child is born and some doctor puts him in a binary gender category. You have all these ideas about yes. my little girl, my little boy, what mm -hmm. they're going to do, how we're going to, and you start feeding them these gendered, you know, they're, they're a script basically. But we're right. not just scripting them, they're also uh, scripting us or we're scripting mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so those are very, you know, I would love the way Bethany's character is so emotional and raw about that because it lets the readers get a good sense of how part of the burden of moving forward are the mm -hmm. deep, deep feelings that uh, are attached to relationships and, and what you thought was going to be a future that is no longer, it, it's been canceled. That, yes. you, you know, idea. Yeah. And we learn later on about Bethany. I'm not going to give it away, but we learn later on about Bethany as you uh, and and the depths of those emotions and some other things that happened in her past with John, and why, for example, he has a hard time. She um, moving forward. In fact, um, I think one of the it's a perfect. Uh, um, Bethany is a per perfect sort of study in the way people uh, when people break up. For example, they mm -hmm. we tend to mourn the, the things that, that in the relationship that in the past that um we, we we mourn what a relationship was number one we mourn what it was not mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we mourn what it could have been mm -hmm. so there's a kind of future projection so there's layers to that to that pro emotional processing and um uh, i think that's why i just love her character so much and the way you drew it it's 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 yeah, I really identify with that. Well, the other thing I like about Bethany is that she says a lot of unfortunate things that are painful, but I want people to see themselves because those are things that we would say at home to our partners, to our wives, to our husbands, like we would say those things, but Bethany just says it out loud. <laughs> That's her problem. She just says it all out loud. Um, but I wanted it to be in there because it was a very important. It's a very important part of our life's journey: what we judge, what we decide for other people. Um, and I, you know, it's it's pretty cruel. And I will tell you that um, writing this book has been an exercise in courage for me because. Um, so I obviously had to work with some trans editors, and they were incredibly helpful. But so I wrote this piece, another thing that Bethany a a rant that she goes on. And, you know, one of the trans editors says, this is very painful for me to read. And um, obviously it wasn't a conversation of take it out, but it was just really, um, I, I would, my instinct was to say, oh, I, that's offensive. Let me take it out. Um, but I just know that it's so important to see it on paper so that we can kind of deal with it. We have to work with the way that we think and the things that we say. Um, even Morgan asking all these dumb questions. You know, I want people to get involved in this conversation. And, and it's not just for trans, it's for black people and Hispanic people and all of the places that we find 
hatred in our in our souls um, to kind of hear ourselves and see what we do to other people when we just go off on things that really have nothing to do with the reality. So I was trying to do that. <laughs> well, you did a great job of it, and and I think. Um, you know the, the the thing about literature. I what I love about good literature is that is it's real. Uh, and one of the things I like about um, in your you have an unconventional romance. You wrote uh, you 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 stepped out. You took a genre and and really opened it up and mm-hmm. transgressed that genre mm-hmm. and yes. wrote an unconventional romance. And most people when they read a Harlequin or something or romance or as we were talking a little earlier, a, a, a lot of lesbian erotica, what have you. You know, it doesn't have necessarily. Um, um, you know, it's supposed to be fan- fantasy. It's supposed to sort of mm-hmm. you're supposed to lose yourself in it, and um, and that's 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 great and fine. I mean, uh, literature is nowadays. I would love to lose myself in <laughs> some things, considering right. reality is difficult right now to process. But I do believe that good literature deals with the real. It deals mm-hmm. with the real where we are in the raw, and then it offers us something more about who we can mm-hmm. become. And that's what I yes. love about this. Is that it gets really down and dirty, and I'm glad mm-hmm. that you in, in the mud, in the muckety mud, but you mm-hmm. do it in a way that to me is not offensive. It, it certainly mm-hmm. I can see people, it brings up emotions, but you're a very careful writer. You're a very compassionate writer. It's obvious that you love these characters in your book, and and you bring them along. Uh, you give them depth. You bring them along, and you don't necessarily over paint them with this sort of romantic f- fantasy brush, you know? So, so we, as people living in the world where we don't know from one day to the next, if we'll have a democracy or a dictatorship or, or if, you know, you, you don't know if you're going to get fired from your job, if someone outs you or something like, mm-hmm. you know, this, this constantly living on the edge. What I love about the Sistitudes is that it gives us inspiration and hope and kind of leads us forward into imagining what we could be in the world if we simply, you know, stepped outside of our skin. If we, you know, question, you know, got behind some of our assumptions. And and my favorite is if you just take a risk. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm an adventurous guy, so that's how I live anyway. Yeah, but if you just take a risk, you never know what you what might happen. What if, right? What if you fall in love with a trans person or uh, someone not of your race or your social class. Um, it could be, it might be the best relationship you've ever had um, <clears throat> in terms of yes. growth, personal growth, in terms of bringing you happiness and love. So I, I, I'm thankful that you, 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 you don't shy away from the real mm-hmm. and, uh, and that you take us, you, you offer us a, a vision of what, what, what we could be if we step into, yeah. you know, this, this thing that we fear so much. Yeah. Yeah, it's about, you know, what's possible. And I think in in a world where there are so many vicissitudes, it's the perfect time to take risks and to try new things and to try on new thinking um, because we have to do it. That's the way to survive. You, you know, you, we, we can't survive. And there's a one little piece in the book where my, it was sort of a character based on my father. Um, and he says to uh, her, you know, you, you've got to keep up with the world, you know, you have to mm. keep up with the world. And even though it's ironic coming from him, because he would have not understood the John thing, um, <laughs> of course. But it, it, to me, that just the idea of we have to keep up with the world is a very powerful idea, and something that you know we all do it reluctantly. But when things are really strange or big, we uh, sort of do the other thing, which is what Bethany does, which is just paint fingers, uh, point fingers, and uh, talk about it in negative ways, which she's, she's not even addressing her own pain. But then, you know, it's good news that it gets worked out. But um, it's important to delve into that, that emotional place where we go. Right. Very good. Thank you. You know, actually, when we're talking about Bethany, um, one of the things I found particularly compelling, and I love this, that the book opens up with Bethany and Renee getting married. Mm-hmm. And to me, uh, I what I love about their relationship in the book is that it's just very much a normal daily, it's a normal relationship. It's normative, normalized in, in right. the book. 
Um, and, 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 and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, so, sort of the, there's a contrast between Morgan and Renee mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. how Renee lives and how Morgan lives and, and what you what you were kind of doing with that. Well, so, I yeah, think, really. yeah, it was important to me to normalize a, a relationship, a gay relationship, a married relationship, a truly committed relationship. Um, and I also wanted to have Morgan, you know, Morgan is very much the reality too. Um, she's African American. She's been divorced. She's a single mom. You know that it, those are very common things that are happening around us, um, and you know to some people's disdain. I mean, some people think it's you know not good, um, but it's not bad. You know, it's reality. And I think I wanted Morgan to be able to go beyond the pain of her past again, like John and everybody else. Um, and to kind of explore something new. But to me, Morgan is a symbol of what's symbol. Um, you can meet somebody who's unexpected. It, you might meet, you know, an African-American woman might meet a white man or a white woman and say, you know, this is it. This feels right. This is the right thing. So I just, it's, it, it's a book about like following your heart and being able to take risks. Um, and there's a, it's what's important in the book is that John is sort of um, has the companionship of his therapist who's throughout the book. So he's always conferring with the therapist. And one of the things he says is there, are, um, there are no risks, only realities. Um, and I think that that is sort of a theme that's in the book as well. Like the things that we think are risks, they're just actual possibilities, opportunities, things that we can do if we try. Um, and so I, I wanted Morgan to be an, a, a great shining example of an African-American woman who had been hurt and who had given up on love and all of those things. And who says, you know what? This one feels right. It feels different, but it feels right. And I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try. Um, and that, that has been powerful. That is a powerful thing. And because, you know, I am in a marriage with a woman and it's the most stable I've ever been, you know, the most reasonable experience I've ever had. So I think that, the, you know, this- I know how that works more, out. Yeah, let me, let me tell you, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> and I am not, I am not, um, I'll be on the news tomorrow for like making children gay, but <laughs> I'm not trying to do that by the way, but I'm just saying that for Morgan, I just wanted her to explore. And that is what, the book is about for her as that developing that character is getting her out of this i'm done with love i was hurt men do this to me all the time i'm out of it and then she meets a man that's fabulous so that's also another important piece because you know african-american men are often um defiled in in literature and they're they have negative connotations about them and i wanted to create an african-american man who was really um, deep and, um, you know, working on anything that was flawed for him as personality wise. And I just wanted him to thrive and learn and try to be deeper than um, is expected of a man, quote unquote, you know? So I, I just really was trying to push the, the agenda for men too. Mm -hmm. And I thank you that as a black, I, I thank you for that as a black man, uh, I, because I get so tired of whether it's the media or the, the you know the um, stories, what have you, or the way just the way people think about black men is violent and and misogynistic. Um, certainly, we have problems in our community, but gee, we're not all criminals and we're right. not all white beaters. Um, <clears throat> so I, I I thank you for that and and. Uh, actually, um, there's another character in the book, Jax, um, and you, you know, they're kind of juxtaposed uh, uh, with John, mm -hmm. and it's a nice counterbalance that kind of highlights. Is that what you were trying to do with Jax? It kind of brings out a bit oh, more yes. of John. Well, because you know, I'm doing reality, right? So, right, John, John is so great, and you know, the chicks love him and all of that. But then he also has that other piece that he walks out in the world, and maybe people can detect um, that he is trans. Um, so there's a scene that really unpacks all of that where somebody who is uh, like a Jamaican guy and um, 
and believe me, I am not doing broad strokes, but I am being realistic. And so I know that there is a lot of homophobia in Caribbean cultures. So that's I true. Yeah. That is that's true. true. That don't is get true. mad. Don't get mad. That is true. Yeah, don't get mad. I, <laughs> don't I, I, get I, mad. I, 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 I will just second that as I, I, I was, I'm considering buying a, a place in the Caribbean. I'm trying to actually immigrate. I don't want to be in America anymore, but it's become difficult to, find an island. I've been, I've lived on quite a, about four islands down there now. And I, I love the island. I love just island culture. You know, uh, Nadia knows what I'm saying. She knows right. that I, I just love island culture, but uh, a, yeah, but the homophobia and the misogyny, I, I can't do it. I mean, I've literally, there are just places I, I'm just, I'm so sad that I'm um, so, I just wanted to second that she's not kidding. You know, we're not trying to paint Caribbean culture with all the entire culture, but I was shocked to find out just how deeply you know, the anti-trans, anti-LGBT stuff is there. So anyway. So that so that thing gets unpacked in the book as well. But yes, I wanted to have John face off with this character Jax. They're exactly the opposite of each other. Um, Jax is a very macho, macho, macho man. He's a Jamaican. He's a um, he's a rapper. He's into hip hop. He has an entourage. Like he's got all of the manly things that that the world thinks is. Manly. He's a chronic. Um, he's got a lot of weed. He's doing it. He's vegan. yeah. He's chronic. You know, he's perfect in that way. Um, and then he's faced with John, and the way that he treats him is so disrespectful, so blatant, so violent. Um, and it's important, like it's important that we look at that too, um, to just see how a regular day turned into this horrible thing that happened um, because of, again, judging, um, making assumptions, you know, making decisions about people. Um, and I just like to really shine the light on that. You did, yeah, you did a great job doing that. And, and it may juxtapose nicely because Jax has that sort of toxic right. masculinity yes. thing going on with himself. And, John, and so John offers us, so again, it's just one of these wonderful ways that you deal with the real and also give us a vision for what something, for, for, for mm -hmm. something better, so, uh, better possibilities. Um, <clears throat> great. Um, we want to check on time here uh, to make sure that we um, leave some time for folks to ask questions. Yeah. Um, so we, get, we got I, about 20 minutes left. A tiny bit. Okay. <laughs> would, would you, we, we wanted, we had another little segment we could talk about, but we also want to uh, uh, let the audience talk to Kim and, and answer some of their questions, ER, if that's the case so far. Well, somebody yeah. asked a question about um, if there's John's point of view is in the book. So I just want to address that quickly. Yes, okay. very much so. Um, what was important to me is not having John as a character that was just everybody else has a thought about, about him. I wanted him to tell his own story. So he has, um, he is sprinkled throughout the book telling it from his perspective, what he's going through. Um, he talks a lot about his uh, rituals, his his shots, all of that stuff. But in first person, it's him telling the story, how it goes. So that's very important. And I'm glad somebody asked that. There is a lot of John, first person, his voice, it's his story. I don't want it to be, because um, there was another big book that came out uh, a couple years ago um, and it had a trans character. So everyone was saying to me, oh, oh, you got to read this book. Run, run, run. You got to read it. So I ran to read it. It's a very famous author. And um, he wrote this wonderful book. But there's just the trans character is just um, sprinkled in, sprinkled in. And he's just a character so that people can make it. It sort of makes it sort of a sexy thing that there's this trans character. But it's not looking at him as a whole. It's not a holistic look at him. And so I was very happy that um, this institute honors the trans character, and he's not just a person that everybody else can talk about, um, <laughs> which is what the other right. way is. So I, I, I felt really strongly about making sure John's uh, point of view, first person, is throughout the book. 
And I'm glad you actually mentioned that example because that's a good example of what I was describing earlier about 40 minutes ago mm -hmm. about how some characters, trans and queer characters, uh, you see it sort of older sort of race too. People do it with race, but uh, people will take these characters and use them as part of the plot uh, to right. move the plot or to, they're, but they're, uh, they're, they're very much like props. They're not even characters. Mm -hmm. right. They're like right. more like, you know, the way black people used to function as props in a movie right. for the Absolutely. white characters. <clears throat> so um, yeah, quick, you, you know, you're, you're amazing, right, Akim? It's just, it's just so nice <laughs> to sit here <laughs> and talk about this. Um, uh, especially since I don't get to really talk about literature anymore, teach literature anymore. I, I teach mainly economics and other types of things. So uh, it's a real joy to read good book and um, and to really talk about the deeper philosophical uh, as well as the literary um, uh, components of, of of your work. So um, this is this is a joy. Um, so if if it looks like there's one more question here, let's let's get another. Somebody here has got a question. Um, which character was the hardest to write accurately? Oh, this is a good one too. The mm -hmm. character you got the hardest feedback about needed to really dig into the most to uncover the layers. So the, the most difficult character, huh? They're, they're all, they were all very difficult in many ways, but I think obviously Bethany was the hardest to write because she was telling it like it was and she was keeping it real. And so it was a, dare, a dangerous character to write um, because I was letting her say all kinds of things that you're not supposed to say and mm -hmm. to feel ways that you're not supposed to feel. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was constantly sort of writing it and being like, ah, oh, should I take that out? That's, that's a little mm -hmm. harsh. Um, you know, uh, I should, but I just kept going with her because she pushed back and she was like, I'm going to say it. So as a writer, and I, my son says that this is crazy talk when writers talk about their characters, by the way. So <laughs> excuse my crazy talk. But um, yeah, I mean, Bethany pushed through. She wanted to say the things she needed to say, and it was very important for the whole story. Um, so I think that she was the hardest to write. And I think John was, I would say John was sort of the easiest to write because he em embodies... He embodies what it is to choose yourself. He mm. embodies that. And I think for all of the other characters, they're all trying to choose themselves in some, on some level, especially Morgan. Um, and so I just poured all of that need to choose yourself into John. And so it was easy to do because it's something that's very important to me and my writing and that my characters are their authentic selves. Um, and so that is why, uh, I think he was the easiest, but um, Bethany was the hardest. Good, thank you. That's a good question. We have another good question here. Um, was there anything you cut from the book that was hard to discard? If so, why did you end up editing it out? Love that question, love it. Yeah, these are great questions. So, <laughs> so end of the book, there used to be a huge scenario. So John works in a high school and I wrote pages and pages and pages about John befriending one of his team, one of his team mates. And um, then he's a young urban kid who gets a girl pregnant. And it was like a trope, a trope, a trope, a trope. So I was going down the rabbit hole of that. And of course, let's say that it wasn't, you know, that bad because it was about um, him getting a girl pregnant and then he wanted to have John adopt the child. And um, so that, you know, it was kind of an interesting story. But after working on the book for so long and, you know, workshopping it intensely in fiction intensives and all of that, I kind of just sort of started to think it was not that interesting. And I was like, I need some other thing. And I also need somebody to not, um, I need this character, whoever this is, I'm gonna make up a new character in my mind, to do something for John to help him with his struggle of coming out. And so I came up with Teague, who's a wonderful character. He's one of my favorite characters and he is um, a young trans teen and he creates a conversation with John about why you're not coming out. And so that was really about the generational change in the trans community, that young trans people are much different than older trans people. 
And so um, I wanted this younger person, bo more bold, more out, to be able to show John that the way is being yourself. And so that's that's one of the things. But the character was called King. And um, I did miss having King. I mean, he was he was a lovely kid and I really liked him, but I just he was he didn't um, have the power for John that I needed this other Teague to do to for, for John, for him to develop. Um, so I think that was one of the things that I had to cut out the whole thing with King. So I King may show up some somewhere else um, in the in the sequel. Because I do miss him, and I think about I think about it, and when people ask me what did I cut out, I am um, sad about King. Any other questions? Kim, what's next? Oh well, there is a uh, there is a sequel in in my brain. W walking around trying to come up with itself. Um, so I, I am thinking about that a lot. Um, and I also just want to continue to kind of have these talks about vicissitudes and I want to hear what people like about it, what they don't like about it, what they question about it. And that helps me um, guide the next story. But, you know, even today I was thinking about it, just walking around and I was like, oh, this is going to be something. So it just comes to me, but I know I have such a great foundation with these characters and they've, they've changed so much and they've had such a great development, but there's much more for them to figure out. So um, what's next is going back in, back into the cave and coming up with the next part of what happens in vicissitudes. And that was something too that I, I meant, meant to say um, in the beginning when I was talking about me reading the book in three days, not being able to put it down, is I get to the end and I wanted more. I was like, mm -hmm. well, what happens? You know, what happens with, I'm not going to give it away, but there, there are no <laughs> five or six, I mean, it just, there, you, you have an ability to, to bring it to a point at the end, you know, but the point is really also an ellipsis because it yeah. really, we're, it begs for more to find mm -hmm. out what, what's then going to unfold in these characters' lives. Again, this is an incredible skill that, you know, writing skill that, that, that you demonstrated. But I very much I thought, well, what, you know, okay, well, this, you know, is this, is, is he going to move? Is she going to move? Is, yeah, I mean, it's just, I, like I said, I don't want to give it away, but there are all these things that you wonder because the book, um, in, the, in the story, there continues to be developments as throughout the whole story that, that, that uh, that's a part of uh, the character's different forms of growth and development and self-discovery. And so um, those things kind of come to a point, but then there, which allows you to, to, to sort of think, okay, this is, this is great. You know, this happened and then this happened and this worked out. But then again, there are all these, you know, the, I had, I just wanted to read more and find out well, well what's going to happen with Bethany and Renee. And then, you know, what about, uh, anyway, so, so so yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> so we definitely want to we want a sequel. We want to find out what happens to these characters in their journey. Um, I'm working on it. Well, um, I I will just there's one other thing that I particularly like in 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 the book, and and again because the book is about relationships, and we've talked uh, about you know trans and queer relationships and some of the things that, that happens in those relationships and. And the, and the impingement on of society, and um, but there's also this. There, there are other types of relationships as well. And for example, mother daughter uh, relationships and or parental relationships rather. Uh, and I, I there's this uh, passage. You know, Renee herself has issues, particularly mm -hmm. sort of left over, and you, you give her an opportunity to sort of express that and talk about that. And so. I was wondering if um, if you could read that little passage about um, Renee and um, her mother, and we could talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. I think our audience also, uh, as you know, most of us are, are, are pro. I, I would imagine our audience is, is pro female, pro women. We understand the importance of mothers and their struggles. And uh, I'm, I'm a feminist. I can't speak for others, but I think a lot of us want to you know, we we're, we want to talk a little bit about that or have you talk a little bit about that, about the, the mother-daughter? Sure. Um, well, 
the, this character, Renee, um, she is um, a very established, very uh, accomplished woman. She's an attorney. She's, you know, very smart. She's a bit of a know-it-all in the book. You'll hear that. Uh, you'll read that. Um, and she had... She's a, a badass. Of, yeah, she's great. She's a badass. She is. No, she's a badass. Her... Yeah. Her, uh, in a her lovable mother, way. Her mother in a lovable way. Um, turned on her because she's gay. And so she carries that. She carries that, um, this um, rejection with her through her life. And then uh, what happens is her mother passes away. And so she is getting ready to go to her mother's cremation. And this is a scene when she's getting ready to go. So imagine this, she's in a, in a closet uh, looking at her clothing and trying to pick what to wear to the cremation. Bertha hated that I never wore dresses. So I perused my closet with care to find something that she would have called manly. Letting my fingers gently dance over the assortment of colorful silks, the memory of her makes me weak. I've always been proud of my work shirts because they're professional, comfortable, and subdued enough to keep people focused on what I'm saying and not what I'm wearing. Standing back, assessing them, I remember the grimace on my mother's face when she saw me dressed for the office for the first time. I still feel the slap across my face that constantly lurked behind her eyes. My knees buckle. I resume searching pausing at a light blue chemise that's usually worn slightly slouched over a pair of lightweight stretch capris with knee-high boots. I recall it's the only outfit of which Bertha ever approved. Finally, a woman's color, she said. Feeling the softness of the sleeve slip between my fingers, I keep looking. Then I see something that would be appropriate, a navy blue long sleeve silk t-shirt and charcoal gray fitted pants with mid-size sized navy pumps with block heels. The gray and navy work well together, somber yet stylish. I'll accessorize with my allig alligator belt, blue satchel, and of course my diamond wedding band. I hear Bertha's words in my ear. Why don't you grow your hair? I hear myself say, <clears throat> because I don't want to. Touching my shorn head, I feel the familiar bumpiness of the micro curls hugging my scalp. It's just the way I like it, which happens to be the way that Bertha loathed. Standing naked in the mirror, the reflection of Bethany's quirky wardrobe signals how different my life is with her in it. She brings color and peace. Always on the thinner side, I can't help but notice how my disease has further trimmed me down, turning me into a mere wisp of a woman. I have mastered hiding behind the foils of fashion finery, never making the truth of my flimsiness evident. So grateful that Bethany sees more to me than the loose skin that dangles from my muscle-free limbs since I've lost my appetite and energy for the gym. Stepping closer to the mirror, a burst of my breath fogs the glass. I am frightened by the resemblance to my mother, which makes me shiver. Like Bertha, my skin has reddish undertones. Our faces share the same backdrop, perfectly made for our wide-set hazel eyes and aquiline noses. Large, naturally crimson lips are our family's trademark. Bertha May Harden had at one time been a beautiful woman. For as long as I can remember, the features she gave us triggered envy and lust in others. Our family's racial ambiguity comes from centuries of old pains and twisted privileges. Bertha never named the breezy island where her people were from, and as children, we pelted her with questions about her history, but to no avail. 15 years ago, it no longer mattered. That was when Bertha broke us all up after I confessed the truth of who I was. Her last fit of cruelty left us all strewn about like missing puzzle pieces. At her instruction, my siblings distanced themselves from me. I had no choice but to do the same. Beautiful. So in there, can you talk a little bit about their relationship and, and, and why that's important for you to put that in there? And, and, and uh, I just want to tell the audience too, there's something uh, there's a, something that happens at the cremation. <laughs> um, I, as a black man, 
when I read the scene, I was floored uh, because black motherhood is sanctity in the black community. So uh, it, it has, a, it has a, it's, 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 you know, it's a sanctuary, you know, and, and so I'm not going to give that away, but there are moments when you get to that passage, you're like, oh, no, did she? Oh my God. So um, that really made me realize at that point, like, this is a big piece for Renee and her own discovery, her own mm -hmm. love of herself, her own development, her own ability to move forward. She's a very successful woman, uh, a badass in all the best sense of the you know word. Um, and then there is the baggage, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I wonder... You know, well, the ostracism, the ostracism with of, with her mother. Um, but I, I think it was important to me because that is something that sort of nags at me um, in my life, that this idea of um, gay people and their families turning on them. Like, I just I can't get used to it. I can't ever rest on it. Like, I just never. It's one piece that just keeps me up at night. I just don't understand it. And I know that it's very driven by religion. And I'm not going to say a thing about religion because I'll get in too much trouble. But I just will say that, you know, organized religion, and this we're seeing this in all over the world, how that is can be so damaging. Um, it takes us away from our love, our ability to love, because we make this decision to love something, um, something that it, we can't even see, really. Um, and we choose to not love the people that are around us and that we've birthed or that we've loved or who we've raised. So I just find that to be very troublesome. So I really wanted Renee to be sort of a symbol of that. First of all, the, the closeness of her mother. She was close to her mother. She loved her mother, but her mother turned on her and turned the family on her. Um, and then that really um, informs who she became. So she's a very... She's very smart, very talented, very much of a bit of an overachiever. Um, and she's a very hurt. <laughs> she's a very hurt person. Um, and I, I really have a lot of um, empathy for her because that is something that's happening every day all around us. Um, and I just want people to look at that as well and just sort of, especially, I, I mean, I could only hope, hope that somebody who has a gay or trans child will read this, I hope. I mean, that is my biggest prayer, that they will see um, how much that, how damaging that ostracism is and how, what a difference it makes in that person. And it turns them into something they were never meant to be, which is vengeful. Um, and I think that that is sort of a destructive path that goes once we're hurt. You know, there's all ways to handle being hurt. You can, you know, cower in the corner, you can stand up to it, you can, and fight back, or you can you know, create a place where you become the super person, superhuman, just in order to make a, a an armor around yourself. And I think that that is sort of what Bethany has done, and I mean Renee has done. And um, she's a hurt person, and I I hope people can see that, and they'll they'll gasp. Um, <laughs> they will. Oh, gasp. it's blasphemous! It's <laughs> blasphemous! It's, I, I I was shocked you put it in there, and 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 I thought. And that was also, I love that you put it in there because I thought this, this woman is bold. This is bold writing. This is going to places where people don't want to go and addressing issues in, in a way um, that's really powerful for people. And, 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 and so when the readers read what, what, what happens in that moment with Renee, when, 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 at her mother's, when, when they read that, that's a very powerful um, it drives it home very powerfully the depth of pain that Renee is suffering from and how far she's pushed that down and it's baked and incubated over the years into and ossified into this kind of very hardened thing, you know, that um that makes her do this thing. At, right. uh, uh, most of us, like I said, people will go, oh, no, she did not. And you're like, yes, she did. No, she did. Oh, girl, yes, she did. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, that sort of thing. So I, I'm thankful, and I and I also just I think I appreciate the 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 that you're so bold, bold in your writing, and that you're you're unafraid, you're dauntless. You 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 have a dauntless uh, aspect about your writing, uh, and I think, and I'm glad that you do that because you're offering readers, you're offering humanity some 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 uh, some truth about uh, mm -hmm. about who we really are, but also mm -hmm. who we can. 
overcome and 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 problems my mother had this interesting way of talking about problems they're not there you can see them as problems but there are also possibilities Abilities, yeah for your own creativity to to, to shine uh, mm-hmm. so my mother had this way of saying problems are just possibilities waiting to happen mm-hmm. and obstacles are real opportunities that are coming your way so this is how you deal with things that look like they're in the way or hurting you or getting you down and so uh, I really love that about about your writing that it, it's mm-hmm. bold it goes there uh, and and it takes us to that again to the to a tough place in, in many ways your book uh philosophically speaking really gets to some of the heart of the hum- the human condition as we call mm-hmm. it, philosophy some of those contradictions that feel irresolvable but deep so deep uh, uh, to our, our aspect of who we are as human beings that we can't just skip over them and pretend like we're not you know dealing with them or they're mm-hmm. affecting them in ways yeah yeah that uh even with her in the closet and so she finally finds something that Bertha liked and then she passes over it. You know, I won't even wear that to your cremation. You know, it's just pain. Um, and pain is so interesting. You know, it's, it's so um, omnipotent and it's everywhere. And we are walking, you know, all of us are walking with some pain and then I just want us to be able to identify it um, and then that helped us go go past it. Well, we're definitely waiting for for the next one, uh, the sequel. And um, so, with that, I just want to ask you to kind of close and let other folks open it up to other folks. Is you know, what do you want readers to come away from the book with thinking? What, do you, what what's the big takeaway for readers? You want? I would love for them to walk away with the idea that love transforms that. Whoever you are, whoever you think you are, who you're supposed to be, there's so many possibilities out there and that can change you and it can take that place of your heart where you say, oh, there's no more love here. I'm signed off of love. Um, And it's possible. Like it's possible if you open yourself up. And I wanted that to be a big thing that love transforms and all the characters are not, they're not all lucky enough to fall in love with John, but they all are lucky enough to see what love really is, what it looks like. It's not this, you know, fairy tale. It's hard, it's painful, um, there's loss involved. And all, all these things transform you. It makes us who we are. It makes us our best selves. And that's what I help people get out of vicissitudes. Excellent. I think that's a, such a great place to wind it up. Um, so I just want to thank you both for this really generous conversation. I want to thank everybody for the wonderful questions that you ask. Kim, do you want to share anything about your other work, your website, all that, where folks can find you online? Um, yeah, my website is www.wordsllc. And uh, you can see just my work and you know my, my coaching. I, I coach writers, so that's like a great joy of mine. Um, and I, it also, you can buy the book, just a couple of them, but there, you should buy it at Karis, of course. Um, and just to see what I'm doing, I'm very busy these days, but I'm really thrilled, um, that I'm writing and working with people who want to write. And it's just really makes my heart sing. So I am so grateful to be here tonight and to have so many people from all over the place. I see all these Hi from Chicago and hi from Seattle and all this and that. Love really Chicago, great. Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you all so much for being here, and I really hope you'll read the book. And I also want you to know that I'm one of those writers that would love to hear from you. So please, you can contact me on my website. Um, I will write back to everybody. Um, I love to hear your voices about the book and if it made a difference for you. So thank you very, very much for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your support. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for the great questions. And we love Karis for, we just love Karis. Yes, we you do know, love Karis. <laughs> we love you, man. It's good to see yes. you again. We love you all. I hope everybody stays safe and well and that we get together in person for the sequel. <laughs> Yes. Um, when, when it's ready, Kim, we'll be we'll be anxiously waiting, and hopefully by then everybody will have a vaccine and we'll be healthy and can all gather in in the physical space of Karis to celebrate. 